So let's give it a few minutes to mm -hmm. for people to join us. All right, got one person so far. Welcome. All right, uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and introduce myself and then Matt can introduce himself and we'll get going. Uh, my name is Logan Reed. I am an Assistant Dean of Admission at William & Mary and I'm helping coordinate the, the digital days for admitted students. And Matt, if you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself then we'll get on our way. Okay, yeah, I have a slide which will cover this in more detail later, but hi, for now, my name is Matt. I'm a senior at William & Mary, double majoring in international relations and data science. And uh, I have the pleasure of being able to chat with y'all today about my experience as a researcher with the Monroe Scholarship Program. Great, and uh, if you have any questions or anything throughout the presentation, feel free to put that in the Q&A section. And if you have any general, you know, if there's technical issues or something in general um, that need to be said, just feel free, you can put that in the chat. Um, but any questions, please put that in the Q&A um, and we'll get to them. Um, it'll be about 15 to 20 minutes of presenting the research and letting you all know kind of what Matt's been researching recently and um and then we'll get to any questions you all might have so matt if you want to go ahead and go for it yeah so again thanks for joining our day for admitted students session on undergraduate research as a monroe scholar uh, at william and mary being a scholar at william and mary has definitely afforded me a ton of amazing opportunities which i wouldn't have had at other schools and really changed my goals in life so i hope that this presentation will help you just a little in your college decision making process as well let me just click to the next slide. Okay, so to start out again, hello, my name is Matt. I'm a senior from Chesapeake, Virginia, and I study international relations and data science. For anyone who may not be familiar with those fields, uh, basically I study everything from international politics and history and language to computer science and spatial data science. Uh, I'm most passionate about building systems that serve the well-being and values of everyone, both in policy and technology. And I'm still learning how I can best contribute to a world which is just, sustainable, secure, and prosperous. Okay, so I've been blessed to be able to pursue a lot of opportunities at William & Mary. Some of those have been on campus and others have been oceans away. Uh, today, I'm going to share three of those experiences which most relate uh, to my research as a Monroe Scholar. So that being my freshman Monroe research project, my upperclassmen research, and then uh, now my honors thesis, which builds on those earlier works. Okay, so part one, understanding foreign aid. In just a brief intro, foreign aid or official development assistance is basically money or other resources which countries send to one another to support economic and social development. It usually goes from more developed countries to less developed countries, and it can be done on a bilateral basis meaning one country sending money or funds to one other country or a multilateral basis, meaning uh, several countries working together. But before we dive deeper into the world of jargon, how did I end up working in global development and aid? Well, it actually all started with my day for admitted students on April 8th, 2017. I didn't really know back then what I wanted to study in college. Uh, I didn't even know where I wanted to attend. I just knew that I'd always been interested in international politics and history, and I had a desire to contribute to a better world, as many William Mary uh, students do. Back then, for DFAS, we only had one day and a list of events to choose from, so we can only attend a couple info sessions. And one that caught my eye was called Data for Good, Research, Innovation, and International Development with Aid Data. They talked about how we can better understand development needs and allocation of aid across the world by talking or taking a spatial data driven approach. And that session convinced me to come to William & Mary and inspired me to work in development policy and practice. Now, skipping forward and it's freshman year, I've enrolled into a mix of intro courses for international relations and data science majors. And I'm even fortunate enough to have had the opportunity to study in DC during winter break. And these classes grew my interest in foreign aid and led me to doing my freshman Monroe project on studying the determinants of foreign aid, basically who gives aid to whom and why. 
the freshman Monroe summer research project is a $1,000 funded opportunity, which should take about 80 hours to complete. And since I also had an internship and a couple other projects that semester, instead of doing uh, two intensive weeks of work, like they sometimes suggest as just a, uh, a base plan to go with, I ended up spreading my research across the entire summer and balancing it with my other like obligations. So each weekday after doing my internship work, I'd go to the gym, cook dinner, uh, hang out with friends, and then go to one of the academic buildings to work for a couple more hours, uh, like late at night before restarting that process. So I was able to have a pretty balanced thing going on while still like looking into these interests, which were really um, peaking my brain and my interest at the time. Okay, project details. Being interested in international history and politics, the question I sought to answer was, how does the nature of US foreign aid evolve between global political eras and how do we understand these periods of change? In simpler terms, did the US give aid uh, during the Cold War for the same reasons it did after the Cold War? Does the US give aid for economically correct incentives like promoting economic growth and equity or is aid allocation based on strategic or political considerations? And what I found was that there are three main frameworks which describe why countries give aid. Recipient need, uh, so on that middle slide right there, um, recipient need giving based on what the recipient country actually needs. Uh, donor interest, which means giving based on what the donor country wants, uh, which doesn't really require that aid being effective to fulfill the goal of the donor country. And targeted development, so that's giving aid based on what the donor country wants, and it requires the aid to be effective to fulfill that goal. Across political eras, the US's aid allocation um, seems to follow different frameworks. So most of the Cold War followed donor interest because aid was primarily used as a tool to buy the allegiance of other countries away from the Soviet Union. Uh, and then the interwar periods, like the 1990s, uh, saw an increase in aid given for recipient need purposes as major power war between the US and the Soviet Union and their allies had declined. But then in the war on terror or the global war on terror, which started in 2001, um, we saw an interesting shift where US strategic considerations regarding terrorism were the priority. But since mitigating terrorism requires like actually addressing those root socioeconomic causes for terrorism, the aid the US sends um, needs to be effective at promoting economic and social development. So it charted a, a different path for foreign aid and its effectiveness than we'd seen in previous decades. And now with a return to great power conflict or some type of international order which mirrors that with the US, China, and Russia, it's the focus of a lot of current research to understand how foreign aid is being allocated now by all countries. And all of that got me thinking whether there was a way to systematically track not only the foreign aid going to other countries, but the other acts of foreign policy which may be taking place. So not just looking at the official development assistance, but also military arms, diplomatic visits, and anything else which could help policymakers better understand how events are unfolding around the world and how to make informed decisions given that information. And this was the motive behind creating and growing my own research team, Geoparsing, in William & Mary's Geospatial Evaluation and Observation Lab, uh, a team to create and analyze comprehensive global events data sets. So I moved out of aid data and recruited a small group of students from a bunch of different backgrounds and disciplines to start answering this question. And over a couple months with the support from colleagues I'd previously worked with actually at ADATA, I arrived at a bare bones methodology for identifying online news media sources to parse for information on these foreign policy events. I then used my upperclassman Monroe um, research funding to spend the summer refining my team's purpose and methods in preparation for two projects we would be doing that following year with the US intelligence community. So one of these projects tracks uh, Chinese development projects in Latin America and the Caribbean with the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. And the other tracks Russian foreign policy across several countries in Central Africa, also with the US government. Um, and just some notes on the Upper Monroe uh, Summer Research Project. 
that is $3,000, which is spread across seven weeks. So the methodology was pretty straightforward. Basically, there are massive amounts of online text-based data in news articles, social media posts, databases, and so on. And by parsing the relevant sources of text-based data, we can track global events. So to start, we, did, we just did this in a very structured Google Sheets. The columns of the Google Sheets included information on you know, the basics, who, what, when, where, why, and how of these events. For example, we might read a news article by CNN, which is describing a hydroelectric dam, what being built in Ecuador, where, by the Chinese Export Import Bank, who, uh, to generate sustainable energy, why, in 2018, when. Or another article on Russian mercenaries, who, training rebel groups, what, in the Central African Republic, where, to gain access to gold and diamond mines, why, in 2019, when. Then based on the insights we gain through that systematic collection of data, uh, we're able to write like comprehensive reports and papers. So that project actually was one of the first of its kind to partner with the US intelligence community. And our work was featured front and center on the intel.gov page for almost a month straight, like right at the top, which is pretty cool. And since then, like universities across the country, including you know Virginia Tech, I think also UC Berkeley, have tried to set up similar um, student partnerships with these agencies to see if they can have their own researchers doing some of the same like groundbreaking work that we are. So I mapped out how our team could split up the work into designated positions and the responsibilities of each of those positions. I also programmed using that data science background, some dashboards to host our data and make it accessible to anyone who wants to use it. And since the Monroe project is very flexible um, and independently completed, I actually completed those seven weeks of work before and after doing a 10 week uh, fellowship in the Philippines where I was working as a data scientist with an NGO in the education policy space. So being a Monroe scholar at William & Mary really can help you access a lot of great opportunities, both like directly part of the Monroe scholarship program, as well as outside of that program, just because People know that when you are a Monroe Scholar that, okay, this is someone I can trust. This is someone who, you know, has goals, has um, these maybe clearly defined interests or uh, a background which seems to like express the dedication and skill set to really do great work. But the research process for geoparsing was very slowly moving, right? Over about two years, we had we've had to train about 30 research assistants because some have graduated or transferred to our other related research teams within William & Mary's Geolab. Um, so there's just been natural turnover, right? And we have a rule within Geolab where students can only work four hours per week unless they like take on additional research credits or something because we don't want to overburden any of the students because that's not cool. We all have lives outside of our work as well. Um, so in that time, we've only man like manually parsed over 1,200 sources for 400 events and composed at by the end of this semester around seven comprehensive, like very highly detailed reports. So that's really cool, but I still think we can do better. And that desire to do more and do it even better led me to pursue an honors thesis in data science, which would integrate machine learning methods with our existing like more manual policy oriented methodology to gain the comparative advantages of both human researchers and artificial intelligence. So this is the part of the presentation where we might get a bit more technical. Okay, so my thesis attempts to streamline the data collection process such that we can devote more time and energy to the interpretation and analysis of our data instead of, so instead of 12,000 or 1200 sources in two years, I want my team in the future, even after I graduate, to be able to parse 1200 sources every hour, right? And we can do that using uh, machine learning. So, but to get there, there's a couple things that we need to do. First, we need to move from Google Sheets to a more robust and controlled environment for interactive event extraction. We need to develop automated scrapers, which identify reliable sources of, of information for us. 
Um, so in, instead of having researchers Googling for hours on end to find some new tidbit of information somewhere out there, that like golden nugget of information after just hitting the wall over and over again, when it comes to just the nature of Google searching, we can have uh, an automated scraper, which is constantly pinging different data sets and different websites and uh, social media accounts to do that for us. Third, we need to integrate machine learning into our event extraction processes to improve time efficiency. And we need to design a flexible platform which can be tailored to new projects, utilize different ML models and be operated by anyone. Because this is something that I want researchers on the other side of the world to be able to do just by downloading out it off of GitHub, which is like this open source um, coding platform where people can share the programs that they write. And I want them to be able to use it in their own work, right? So I don't want to build something that only my team can use for a very specific project, but rather something that even someone who doesn't have expertise in natural language processing or computational linguistics because I know I, I definitely do not have expertise in the latter. Um, I want them to be able to use this uh, technology in their own work as well. So to get out of Google Sheets, which are just so susceptible to various user end error, errors, whether they are typos or accidentally deleting cells or so on, we've been programming a much more rigorous platform using Python's Django framework. So on the slide, I've diagrammed in the top left how Django connects the back end uh, data to the front end user interface using these things called models, views, and templates. Um, and on the right, you can see like a page once it's actually like in Google Chrome, where um, on the right, someone can just click out a, a like a source or an like a bit of information to read, and then they can fill out a much cleaner, simpler form where they can now write that who, what, when, where, why, and how of the event instead of having to navigate this giant, ugly spreadsheet to do the same thing. To develop automated scrapers, which bring the information to us, we've started setting up multiple pipelines to existing events data sets, um, primary sources from Google News and other sites and Twitter. So we send out frequent queries and then store the return sources in our databases to be parsed. And the goal is to eventually have like tens of millions of sources in our database. So that's accessible by like people on our team, as well as people again, like anywhere in the world, just because all of this is open source and openly collected. Um, and I'm also designing a system which enables us to integrate machine learning into our workflow. So right now those functions are pretty clunky. Um, but over time, as we collect more data manually, we're actually developing the training data for future deep learning models to mimic the nat like the manual event extraction and parsing processes. So of course, all that number crunching is happening in the background and all the user needs to do is press a couple buttons and suddenly all the work is done for them and they just need to check like, did the computer do a good job of it? So much, much faster than having to read through like dozens of articles on your own and pull out that information bit by bit. And then lastly, I've just been programming a separate website as well to host the data reports and other findings from all of GeoParsing subteams in one central location. Because at the end of the day, um, we are trying to be like a half think tank and half data workshop. Um, so even though I'll be graduating in May, this project will continue to grow into something which hopefully makes a massive contribution to the natural language processing literature and on the grounds operations to collect meaningful data to inform good policy making. Um, or, you know, however else people around the world tried to integrate this, this platform into their own research and workflows. But now that I have probably lost everyone in the data jargon, here are some pictures of all the places that researching at William & Mary as a Monroe Scholar has enabled me to go to hopefully reel you back into the presentation and share why William & Mary might be the right place for you too. So, you know, I've been to the Dominican Republic, uh, Indonesia, the Philippines, Thailand, and, you know, the Sunken Gardens, of course, uh, to have a picnic or two with my research team when we aren't working. Uh, so thank you so much for listening. If anyone has questions about the Monroe Scholars Program and summer research projects or anything else, feel free to put them in the Q&A menu and we'll start working our way through them.
Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Thanks for your presentation. Uh, yeah, like you said, the, feel free to put your questions in the Q&A. We'd be happy to answer them. And it can be also uh, specific to his research about the Monroe Scholars Program or about student life in general, you know, anything William Mary related. Like how research has changed on campus now that uh, COVID-19 has moved a lot of things virtually as well. And Matt, why don't you uh, get us started on your why William & Mary story? Why did you choose William & Mary? Okay, yeah. So I had applied to probably about a dozen schools, um, but I didn't really know what I wanted to study. Uh, this is a similar project I'm facing now for grad schools, but nonetheless, um, I, as I said, I was interested in international politics and history, and I knew that I wanted to make you know, some type of positive difference in the world. So. I ended up coming to the day for admitted students at William & Mary just because it's about an hour's drive away from Chesapeake, my hometown. Um, and that was actually my birthday weekend. So I was like, okay, if I'm coming here, it better be good. Um, it had, you know, that day was beautiful weather, much like today, actually, even though I'm inside right now, so you can't tell. And overall, that was Monroe Scholar Weekend. So we went to a bunch of different presentations to talk about or listen to how being a Monroe Scholar can impact our time at William Mary and in undergrad. And I went to that one presentation given by A Data about how like more effective aid allocation can lead to, you know, just better outcomes around the world um, in terms of people's livelihood. And then like down the road, um, like the foreign policy that the US pursues and the ways that we're able to collaborate with other countries to hopefully create a more like prosperous world. So that really resonated with me. And I remember leaning over to my mom who was sitting next to me about 10 minutes into the presentation, 50 minutes left to go saying, I'm coming to this school. Uh, we'll figure out the rest later. And probably one of the best decisions I've made in my life. So I'm, I'm very thankful to have had the, that opportunity. And yeah, William Mary has been pretty awesome today. <laughs> awesome, that's so great to hear. Um... Yeah, so if y'all have any questions, just feel free to throw it in there. Um, how, Matt, how do you feel like um, your interactions with faculty have been um, when you've interacted with them, whether it be in class or in research? How would you describe our faculty? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, actually, I know that I've definitely learned the most like with all of my outside the classroom interactions with my professors or just staff, whether it's at the Charles Center or um, the Reeve Center for International Studies or all of, or the Global Research Institute or here at Geolab. Um, I, I think a, it, a lot of my professors have become like very close mentors to me. Um, and when I was applying to some national scholarships earlier in the year, I don't know if anyone's familiar with like the Rhodes Scholarship to study at Oxford, but I was a finalist for that. So that's like the top 256 students in the country. And I really wouldn't, I didn't, even know about it. And I didn't even think that um, I should ever be someone who's qualified for that. But a lot of my professors said like, hey, I think this is something that you might be interested in. And we'd be willing to like write a recommendation for you just because, you know, we spent a lot of time with you and we've seen you grow and like we think that you can do these types of things. And I think that that type of um, not only like professional relationship, but also like friendly relationship is something which can be unique to William & Mary. And I think that's why in a lot of national rankings, when it comes to like, like student faculty ratio and um, student happiness with their learning and with their professors, I think that's why we rank so high because student faculty research studies and relationships at William & Mary are, it, it stands out, it's pretty, I'm very thankful for the mentorship I've received here. That's so awesome to hear. And congratulations on, on being, being a finalist and everything. Uh, we actually we have a question that just popped up. Uh, what funding sources are your professors counting on for their research? And then they say NSF question mark, DARPA question mark. <laughs> yeah. Um, so for the GeoLab, the Geospatial Evaluation Operations Lab or Observations Lab, we get funding from a couple of different sources. It's all through our main professor, uh, Daniel Renfola. Um, I think he's had NSF funding in the past, but then also we work with uh, the University of Columbia's like CSUN program, which I think is 
like environmental science and so forth. Um, so that's a graduate institute there, which we partner with and they pay our researchers for the NGA uh, and the other organizations that my team works with specifically. We have different pockets of funding which come through our professor. Um, our Geolab also partners with different UN organizations like the International Fund for Agricultural Development and various uh, like non-governmental organizations like Nuru International. Um, actually, I think they're also partnering with the Department of Health right now or Department of Homeland Security rather and a couple other things. So we got funding from a couple different streams. Um, the GRI, they've had multi-million dollar contracts or the Global Research Institute. They've had multi-million dollar contracts from USAID being the Agency for International Development, um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and so forth. So we get our funding from uh, a variety of places. Yeah, that's all really impressive stuff. I mean, the fact that we're working with Pete, like a, a institute that works with grad students mainly, and they're like working with us. Um, that's that's really cool to hear. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and what's unique about I think the Geo Lab especially is that what we do here as undergrads um, is work that at probably ninety percent of other other institutions, ninety percent being uh, a low ball number. I think it might be higher than that to be honest. Um, they'll have graduate students or faculty doing, um, whether that's interacting with like university staff um, and university administrators on the day-to-day -day operations of how to run a research lab, or it's the actual research itself working directly with our partners at the NGA, the DHS, um, the UN. Like it's students who are running the show and it's students who are like the ones on the phone or nowadays on the web call with these like professionals at all of these different organizations um, doing that type of professional work. It's not grad students, which is a very, very unique opportunity, which we can enjoy and sometimes take it for granted here. Um, and I don't think is always accessible and definitely not as easily accessible at other institutions. Yeah, that's uh, always helps people that in the information sessions, like that you get so much of uh, access and opportunities at the undergrad level that you know usually you have to wait till a grad level or a doctoral level to to get to. Mm -hmm. um, so someone asked, uh, how has grad school applications how, how have they gone for you? Yeah, so like I said, um, I I made it to the final round for the Rhodes competition, which is to study at the University of Oxford in England, and that was to do a two years master's degree in development studies. Um, but since then, oh, I was also a finalist for the Beinecke. Um, scholarship, which is a national scholarship in the social sciences and humanities. But since then, I've actually taken a pivot and decided to spend one year um, just working to, I think, pinpoint exactly what my thesis would be in grad school and what the focus is I want to study. Because I'm at this very broad intersection of IR, um, innovative technologies, and like socioeconomic justice. So that really leaves much of the world open to me when it comes to what opportunity should I work towards next. So I'm taking that time to find the exact program, which is a perfect fit. So between now and then, I'm working with the New York City's Department of City Planning on their data engineering team to, you know, create these actual like physical systems which are promoting better livelihood around the, the city of New York. And then um, planning to move to Japan to live with my brother there for a while while applying to grad school's next cycle. So in December and probably looking to study in the UK again, either in development studies again or in like social data science. Uh, that all sounds so exciting. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we got a minute left. So if anyone has any questions, please feel free to click submit. Um, but Matt, I want to thank you so much for presenting your research and talking to these students about kind of what you're going through and kind of what that could look like for our prospective students and um, attendees. Thank you so much for attending. Uh, congratulations on getting accepted and, um, and, and everything. And so we are so excited for, to possibly have you on our campus in the fall. Um, so yeah, I hope everyone has a good rest of their day and thank you all so much for attending. Yeah, thank you again. Awesome. See y'all later.